Welcome. You're listening to The Aligned Self, conversations in creating a conscious and abundant life. This is Daniel DeNovi. I'll be your guide and host. Let's see just where we can take this. Hello, friend, and welcome back to the conversation. Just so you know, I'm still accepting registrations for my signature coaching program, The Aligned Self which is the title of this podcast. But in The Aligned Self, we talk about self-identity and how to recreate yourself, actually align your heart with your mind and your body so you are a congruent expression in the world, a concentration of power. And the reason this conversation or this coaching program is so important is because I've identified this self-identity, the self-concept as being the governing factor in your level of happiness, your level of achievement, your performance in life and in relationship. And on a very fundamental level, how you create reality, how you create your world. And so if you're interested in a quantum leap in performance, up-leveling your game, up-leveling business, relationships, every aspect of your life, then my coaching program, The Aligned Self, is for you. And to learn more, go to yesdaniel.com. Links are in the show notes, but this episode is in the whole idea concept of self-identity, and we're going to talk about the patterns that we put in place to protect our ego, protect our persona, the mask that we show the world, the I that we call us. And the reason these behaviors show up is because our sense of self, by and large, the majority of people, you've inherited your self-identity your self-concept. You just kind of accepted it based on what other people were saying, some experiences you, you've had, and then your assessment of how you showed up for those behaviors or what you were left with after that event. Now, what's interesting is as I describe your self-identity here, there might be some unconscious patterns come up that you throw out in order to protect your sense of self, your idea of who you think you are. Your self-concept is just an idea that you've adopted about who you are. So I'm going to say something and just watch the response inside you. Do you agree? Or is there some aspect of defense that you throw out? Essentially, who you've come to know yourself to be is a hodgepodge of different beliefs, different perceptions, different ideas that have been pieced together in a haphazard construction. And you refer to that as your self-identity. That's the way you've come to know yourself to be. And because it is somewhat fragile, and it's not necessarily grounded on deep principle, there are times in your life where you become confronted, either by a decision or by a thought pattern, by new ideas, and you have unconscious patterns that show up that defend your ego, defend your sense of self. They take you out of the game of life. They actually take you out of the game and put you on the bench or in the stands where you're no longer participating full out in the process, in the event. Part of you has checked out an act of self-preservation. And at the fundamental center of it is the emotion of fear. And because most people do not like that feeling of fear, They tend to do almost anything to get away from, to escape that feeling of fear. And when that fear comes up, we'll refer to that as being confronted. There is something about the decision. There's something about the conversation. There's something about this situation where I feel confronted. My sense of self is at risk. And because of that, there are a number of unconscious behaviors that may come up that I want to point out to you. So you can recognize them when they do come up, and then you can either choose them for what they are or take a different approach because you recognize, oh, this is actually taking me out of the game. This is getting in my way. This is a form of self-sabotage. And like I said in the episode on shadow beliefs, more than likely it's pointing out, or I guess if we accept it as true, it's pointing out the, the possibility that I'm not enough, confirming this this belief that I don't want to be true, but I believe it on some level. 
And if I really think about it, if I'm really present to it, which I don't want to be, I don't want to be present to the idea. Most people don't want to be present to the idea that I'm not enough. And that could show up as I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable enough. I'm not deserving. I'm not worthy. Some variation of that. Or it might not be that shadow belief, but it might be some other belief. That's just typically the most prevalent. So I guess in the end, the feeling I want you to be aware of is, am I feeling confronted? And then you can dig deeper. I wonder what that's about. Now, the behaviors that I'm going to discuss here are going to basically fall in the categories of the stress response, the fight, flight, or freeze response. You know, whenever there's a threat, we tend to either want to run away, we want to stop and fight, or we just freeze. And I guess I'll talk about the running away pattern first. See, the first pattern that we typically express is some type of running away, some type of avoidance. So one example of that might be you are supposed to have or should have a conversation. There's something that needs to be said and it's unpleasant in your mind. You really don't want to have the conversation. There's something about it that is confronting or you have to admit, you know, some source of fear there. So in the back of your mind, you think it's better to just not have the conversation, to avoid having the conversation, just to not call, not be present. You might even avoid the person. So if you've been waiting in the wings for a phone call from someone to complete on something, to say something, and they are avoiding the topic, avoiding the conversation, they are confronted about some aspect of that conversation, that in some way it's going to validate something about themselves that they don't want to face. And it might be just something as simple as facing your disapproval. Like they don't want you to disapprove of their behavior, their decision, their choice, because they want you to like them. Not calling or not having the conversation is one aspect of the running away. Another behavior might be out and out lying or withholding information. Basically, if I was to tell you everything, you might not like me. You might not like this. So there's a withholding. That's because they're confronted about being responsible for the situation. And when people are responsible, they have to own it as an aspect of them. And they don't want to, or you don't want to. Maybe that's why you're withholding. Then some people think it's easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission, because they don't want to present the possibility of you saying no or encountering a no. So, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to talk about them. Like, that's what they do. So you can look at it from someone else's eyes because, you know, you don't do this stuff. But, you know, in the description, you can be in the wondering, is this behavior that I am engaged in? Is this behavior that I use? So getting back to the example of withholding information, sometimes people make decisions that involve another person, yet they don't have that conversation up front about the ramifications and the consequences, Think that thinking that you can just iron it all out on the other end. What that does long term is that it undermines your trust in the situation. The underlying communication behind withholding information is, I don't respect you enough to give you all the facts. I don't think I don't want to encounter your opinion. I don't want to listen to your point of view. You don't really matter to me. Now what they think might matter to you, but that's the communication that's delivered when you don't give them all the facts, when you withhold information thinking you're getting away with something or that you'll be able to smooth it over later. Another area that you may be withholding and I'm going to say you is because this is with yourself. Sometimes we withhold looking at something or being present to certain information because if we were to really give it the attention it was due, it might invalidate a decision that we're making or a dream that we're holding. So we may not honestly look at the risk involved in going ahead. We'll play it off like it doesn't really matter or we'll be able to rise above it. Yet in the background of your mind, remember you cannot not think of something. So when you push it aside, when you choose not to look at it, you think you're hiding it or you think you're not focusing on it. It's there in the background. And many times I'll ask my clients this question. Let's pretend it's three years from now and you went ahead with your intention. What would be, 
based on your current knowing right now, if you were just to guess and imagine, what would be the cause of the failure? And 10 out of 10 times when I position it, just imagine, like using the imagination, it's not the truth, just imagine what the problem might be. They know exactly where the chink in the armor is. They know exactly what's not in place. They know the entire problem. They already know how it's going to turn out three years from now, but they're not yet willing to look at it. And this could be a business idea. This could be a relationship. You know, in the back of your mind, it's just not going to work out. It's not going to work out long term, but you're crossing your fingers and you're going ahead. But inside, you know, you intuitively know what the problem is. But because we don't want to be responsible for that decision at this point in time, we're going to play it off and encounter it down the road. We know it's coming. We do know it's coming. It is the one thing, our one fear that we don't want to face. And we push it away. Yet it's there the whole time. And why don't we bring it up? Why don't we address it? Because if we're the one to address it, if we're the one to bring it up, if we're the one to call it quits and say, hey, I already know this isn't going to work, then we turn out to be the bad guy. We turn out to be the one that could potentially hurt somebody else's feelings. So rather than face the disapproval of someone else by us owning our feelings and saying, hey, this isn't working for me, we tend to hide our head in the sand, pretend that we don't know what we know, and we go along with the program, hoping that the other person will reach a point where they don't want us around. Whew. Relieve us of the, the responsibility of being the one to say, hey, this isn't working, or I don't want this, or I like you a lot, but I don't think this is a long-term gig. We do anything to avoid the sharp pain of that disapproval and rather live in an illusion, the suffering of a long-term illusion, rather than be in the momentary disappointment. This is a misguided strategy in order to protect the fragile ego, to not appear as if we're a bad person, to not appear as if, you know, we're not the one to say, hey, I don't like you. And we use the excuse that we're protecting the other person's feelings. No, you're not. You're protecting your own self-esteem. You're protecting the goodwill that the other person shows you. You're protecting yourself from the potential anger and frustration that might be shown by the other person if you're truthful and honest with your emotions. What people don't realize is that when this occurs, when you manipulate the conversation, when you hide how you really feel in order to avoid confrontation, to avoid the disapproval from someone else, it is an insidious form of manipulation. It is out and out lying. It is misleading and misrepresenting yourself. And I might add, completely disrespectful of the other person's feelings, you should be honest to give them the opportunity to make a choice, the opportunity to walk away and maintain their dignity. But no, we lie. We lie and hide our true feelings in order to pacify the situation, to kind of avoid being with the truth. Because on some level, we feel that the truth will tarnish our self-image. And yes, I can raise my hand and say, I did that once upon a time. I have done that in the past. I no longer do it because I get, I get the impact of it. And frankly, my self-concept is no longer that fragile anymore. My wish for you is that you don't get three years down the road and look back after everything fails and the dust clears and you say to yourself, oh, I knew it. I knew it way back when. I, I just didn't want to face it then. The responsible thing to do would actually be to look at that fear, look at the reason why you think it would fail today and address it. Either head it off, put in a contingency plan, put in some other procedure. Maybe you even need more money. Maybe you need counseling. Frankly, I think if you're on the front end of a relationship, counseling is the last thing you should engage in unless it's for your personal growth, not to bring the other person online. Now, I just came across a snippet from Kim Kardashian, and I don't follow the Kardashians, but sometimes you can't help be exposed to this stuff. But she said this about her former husband, Kanye uh, West, is that she knew she knew that it wasn't going to work on the honeymoon. And I'm like, eh, sweetie, you knew it before 
the honeymoon. You just didn't want to admit it. And I don't know how long they were married, but it was more than a couple years. And to think that she spent that whole time in the knowing this isn't going to work. Why stay that long? You, there, there's nothing that complicated that you can't untangle yourself from. What a waste of time. Again, and I can only say that because I have not extracted myself from previous situations that I knew weren't going to work. I hid the information from myself. I didn't want to be present to it. I didn't want to be responsible for it. I didn't want to be the bad guy and be the one to say, hey, this isn't going to work for me. And so I withheld the information. I went ahead anyways. I wasn't 100% into it. Part of me was always looking for the door, always looking for the next best opportunity, knowing that somewhere out there is the woman that's really for me, who I happen to be with now. But oh my gosh. I wasted my time. I wasted other people's times. It was a waste of energy and all because I wanted to look good. So the theme here is avoidance, avoiding directly dealing with the situation, dealing with the fear, being present to it, actually handling into it because there's this unpleasantness. Like if I have to face the fear, oh, it's just not going to feel good. And oftentimes this is where the spiritual bypass shows up, where we try and take the high road, the high vibe approach, and we don't want to be in the mucky muck feelings. Yet, as I suggested, or as I talked about in the previous podcast episode, working through your emotions, the first step is acknowledging how you feel. You don't necessarily have to be with it very long, but just be present to it. Yes, I feel fear. There's fear coming up. And then acknowledge it, then handle it, because no emotion stays with you forever. You can work through anything. You know, I'm looking at how much time has elapsed so far since the beginning of this, and I think I'm going to do three separate episodes. Here I'm talking about the avoidance aspect, then I'll talk about the freeze aspect, and then in the end, I'll the third episode or in the series here, I'll talk about the fighting aspect of it. And with that said, we'll talk a little bit more about this avoidance aspect. Now, sometimes people have the feeling like they just want to run away. I wish I could just get away from it all, from the, you know, take a vacation, take a month off. I want to get away from the kids. I want to get away from the family because there's a certain aspect of that role that you stepped into that isn't authentic. You're not being authentic in that role. And that could be your self-expression of your self-identity. The identity that you've adopted has been, I guess, adopted in order to fit in, put your best face forward, you know, look good to other people, be responsible. You know, you're showing everyone else that you're responsible, yet you really don't want to be. Life shows up as duty and obligation and not as a choice because of the agreements that you've made because, frankly, you didn't want to look bad which reminds me of a client that I had one time. He was a lawyer. He'd been a lawyer for 15 years and absolutely did not like it. But he encountered me. He took me on in order to upgrade his performance because, frankly, he was told if his performance did not improve, the way he was showing up did not improve, they would let him go. And so in my interview with him, I wanted to get a finger on what aspect of being a lawyer did he love? Because I always want to connect with the passion first. What do you love about this? And then we can build on and expand from there. Well, as it turned out, there was nothing about being a lawyer that he enjoyed. Nothing. He dreaded every day going in. And I said to him, have you ever considered leaving the profession? Quitting. Don't wait until you're fired. Quit today. Start looking for something that you would really love to do, really enjoy. And he's like, I can't quit. I have nine years invested in my education. Some people took seven years, and it took me nine years. And over $200,000 I've invested in this career and 15 years. And my response to him, well, I understand. So if you predict out five years from now, how are you going to feel? What is life going to be like? Are you going to enjoy it anymore? Is life suddenly going to take off and you're going to fall in love with your job or are you just going to muddle through? And he thought about it for a second. He says, I guess I'll just muddle through. I can make it work. It's not that bad. So why would he avoid making a decision? Why would he stick with something that he absolutely didn't like? He admittedly 
didn't like. He didn't like any aspect of it. Why would he stay with it? Why would he delay or avoid making a decision? The answer is in the very next episode. I decided to break this episode up in half because it went a little longer than I anticipated and I wanted to make it a digestible amount for you to listen to. So the topic of avoidant behaviors that come up when we're confronted, when our self-esteem, our self-identity is confronted, will be continued in the very next episode. So until next time, this is your friend and host, Daniel DeNovi, urging you to follow your bliss, live your life from inner signals, be inner-directed as you engage in the epic adventure.